Good morning. Um, this is a trip back home. Isn't that interesting? I've talked so much about other places. And then here I'm um, uh, moving back to Europe and more precisely to my own country. So it's, it's a, a nice feeling and we have to welcome a compatriot there in front who is from Antwerp. So this is uh, for her, I know how important it is. So uh, the, actually I wanted to show, this is part of the Northern Baroque art. And when we talk about Northern, it's interesting to, to know that we don't talk about Scandinavia, uh, very little about Germany, but mostly about that these two very small countries that are in Northern Europe, which uh, nowadays Belgium and the Netherlands. And so this was the center of art in the 17th century beside Versailles, but a much more active and more original uh, kind of art than uh, we find in other places. So come in, come in. The flyers are over there on the table. If you can, you see. You can see. So on the table, you have the flyers, the list of illustrations. Yes. Thank you. So um, when I give the name of Mannerism in Antwerp, it's going to be just a, a little section that's going to show you what happens actually before Rubens comes back from Italy. And it seems strange to talk about one man who is going to change the art in Antwerp, literally. So when we talk about the northern countries, we have to talk about people that were ruling that place. And we have to talk about the family of the Habsburg, uh, that long line of uh, princes and others. Um, Siomara, the, the flyers are on the table over there. Um, that's, that's, it's a family that goes back to the uh, ninth century where, I mean, as, as rulers, uh, but because of uh, smart marriages and so on, they came to, to literally own about, I would say, a third of Europe. And uh, the, as you can see on the map here, and we'll detail why, they start in Austria, but by Mar and they had at that time also the southern part of Italy and Sardinia, um, but by a very smart marriage between Maximilian and the heir to the Dukes of Burgundy, uh, they inherit the Low Countries, a good part of what is here, and then Spain because um, the 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 children of Mary are going to marry into the the family of Spain, and so this ends up being a, a huge. Um, territory, plus we have to remember the new world, which is quite considerable too. So as uh, you have in print, I gave you the genealogy of the uh, Habsburg in the 16th century. And I really insisted in doing so because when you see the cross marriages, very close, first cousins and nieces and, aunt, you know, and, and uncles and so on, you realize there's no surprise that the Habsburg ended up particularly in Spain, so inbred that uh, they ended up with no air and the guy couldn't, could barely walk. You know, he was so, so uh, attired. So let's look at it. And we have, as you can see, most of what covers Europe. We have the Valois in France, the Burgundy, also part of France in the North country, uh, Austria and the German territories, Aragon and Castile in Spain and in England, the Tudor. So all these lines, what you find is what it starts with uh, Ferdinand and Isabella that are going to marry and kick out the Moors for a last time. 
and uh, establish uh, a more united uh, Spain, because before that, Spain was made of different states, as uh, it still is Germany for a long time, and Italy too, by the way. But then next to them, we have Mary. And Mary is the last heir of the Dukes of Burgundy. Her father dies in a battle against the Swiss uh, quite uh, unexpectedly and early. And so she's the only heir to the, uh, that side of the family and considered the richest woman in Europe at the time, by the way, she's married the rich for many. But she, the problem she has is that she has a terrible enemy, all the Burgundy had, with the King of France, particularly at that time, Louis XI. And Louis XI wants to, he wanted to bring Mary to France. He wanted to take back everything that is, was owned by her. And for, the only way to protect her was to marry her to uh, Maximilian of Habsburg, the emperor. And so that's a very important marriage, as you can imagine, as you saw on the map, it brought lots of territories together that were super important. So Mary and Maximilian marry and have two children, Margaret and Philip the Handsome. Uh, Ferdinand and Isabella have a whole series of children among which Don Juan, who is the heir to the throne, uh, Joanna, and Catherine. Catherine is going to marry, she's the famous Catherine of Aragon, who marries uh, Louis, uh, Henry VIII. Uh, Joanna is going to marry Philip the Handsome. And guess what? Margaret is going to marry Don Juan. <laughs> That's fine. There's no crossbreeding there. It's what's result from there that is going to start the, the crossbreeding. Now, what is really interesting is that the Poor Margaret, who's a really interesting uh, figure, by the way, and we, we might talk about her later. Um, Margaret uh, uh, had been promised to the heir of the throne of, to the throne of France. And um, she was taken to the court in France at the age of three to make sure she would be raised in the spirit of the court and know perfectly French. By the age of 12, they changed their mind and decided that no, the heir of France was going to marry somebody else. And they kicked her out and sent her back home. So there's the, the little girl. And then she's promised to Don Juan, uh, goes to Spain. So does Philip the Handsome, who marries Joanna, who will be known later as Joanna the, the Mad. Uh, yeah. And. Um, Apparently, Margaret and Don Juan got along really well, too well, and he died a year later. They say that he had some excess in the bedroom. So that's the excuse for his death. Uh, but uh, anyway, she finds herself uh, a widow, no children, and she's sent back to the court in Belgium. And what her role is really important is she's the aunt of Charles V. And she's going to be very instrumental uh, in the way they um, manage the country. She's going to be very trusted by him in that regard. Philip the Handsome so marries Joanna, and they have a whole series of children, as you can see. Um, Joanna, unfortunately, and the, the story is not very clear if she really lost her mind, but ended, ended up she... Um, she was trying, there, there, there were some political plots in there too, but she ends, ends up being uh, interned uh, under the pretext that she wasn't sound of mind. Uh, but anyway, if we forget about Joanna, here we have the children. Eleanor is going to marry Francis I, the King of France. Charles V, the future emperor, uh, who is a Habsburg, is going to marry Isabella of Portugal and have himself the descendants to the throne of, um, of Spain. Isabella marries the, the king of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And uh, Ferdinand he marries Anne of Hungary, who becomes the sister-in-law of Charles. Uh, Mary marries the brother of Anne of Hungary, uh, Louis II of Hungary, and Catherine um, marries John III of Portugal. 
we know that Henry had uh, Elizabeth with Anne Boleyn, and so that is just there, but also had Mary of England. And so when we jump the next generation, we see that Francis and Eleanor have a, uh, an heir to the throne who is Henry II, who is marrying Catherine of Medici. They have nine children. One of them is Elizabeth of Valois, who is going to become the third wife of Philip II, King of Spain. The, his first wife is Mary of Portugal. So if you look well, he is marrying his the uh, first cousin. Okay. Mary of England is a second cousin. Elizabeth of Valois is a first cousin. And Anne of Austria is also a first cousin. So you can see how close the, this, this is. Uh, I put in blue here two figures that are really interesting, especially in the old materials. Isabella, uh, the Archduchess, uh, Isabella, and Albert, her cousin and husband, uh, Albert. Uh, so they are first cousin, they marry, they have, apparently have a really happy marriage, but no children. And they will be uh, really important when we talk about the, the um, peace of 12 years that's going to happen in the, the low countries. They have been very good managers of the low countries. Unfortunately, he's going to die rather uh, young and uh, she's going to remain there for a while and then retire in Spain. So when we see Maximilian, who is the son of Ferdinand, um, he marries also a first cousin, Mary. And they have 14 children beside Albert. So we see women when they were good, were real you know, reproduction tools. That's about what they were. They, that's all they were is they were pregnant all the time if they didn't die early in childbirth. So I thought this was a really interesting thing. Keep it there, uh, pin it on your wall. <laughs> it makes you understand everything that we're going to talk about uh, later. So Antwerp and the Low Countries. This is an interesting way, uh, the, the way the Low Countries were shown early, uh, showing the, the lion. Uh, and this shows on the north, you have uh, what is now Holland, and then here you have Belgium, and part of Belgium that is, uh, became French later on. The Leo Belgicus, it's named in Latin. Now, from the mid 16th century on, um, that uh, region is going to know a lot of uh, wars and, and conflicts, and we're going to go uh, through them in a minute. I wanted to show you also a map of Antwerp uh, that go back to the time. And Antwerp is in the north of Belgium. Uh, the low countries at that time were uh, made of 17 provinces. And uh, uh, Antwerp is uh, one of them, and so, I mean, is the center of one of them, and here is the old Antwerp, very typically protected by big walls, and along the river Schelde, as you say in, in Dutch or in Flemish, uh, Schelde, the uh, Schelde River, the Esco in French, very rich city um, it, that inherited all the commerce that was in originally in Bruges. Uh, if you remember, Bruges was a very rich center in the 16th century, but unfortunately, uh, the Zwin, which was part of the harbor of uh, Bruges and was allowing a lot of uh, ships to come with their cargo and so on, uh, silted. And that was uh, a progressive decline of the city. And by that time, everything was transferred to Antwerp, and that's when uh, Andrew, Antwerp uh, grew in importance. 
and literally the city doubled its population between 1500 and 1569. At the end of the 15th century, the foreign trading houses were transferred from Bruges to Antwerp. And where we know that the old Mediterranean trade routes were gradually losing importance, the discovery of new sea routes uh, via Africa, uh, by the south of Africa to Asia and via the Atlantic to America helped push Antwerp to a position of prominence. By 1504, the Portuguese had established Antwerp as one of their main shipping bases, bringing in spices from Asia and trading them for textile and metal goods that they could find there. So the city's trade expanded to include cloths from England, Italy, and Germany, wines from Germany, France, and Spain, salt from France, wheat from the Baltic. What happens too is that when you have such a, a wealth of import export, you also have skilled workers. And so there was a lot of skilled workers that were possessing uh, soap, fish, sugar, and especially cloths. Uh, the, when you talk about money, you have banks. And so you started having banks from all over Europe that had their center in Antwerp. And so they had their first equivalent to Wall Street, the, the Bourse uh, in uh, Antwerp that opened in 1531 to the merchants of all nations. And Antwerp became the sugar capital of Europe importing the raw commodity from Portuguese and Spanish plantations on both sides of the Atlantic. So uh, the golden age of Antwerp is actually very tightly uh, linked to the, um, sorry, for the, the, the age of exploration. So you had hundreds of ships that would pass in a day and about 2000 carts would enter the city each week. So imagine the, the movement that, uh, that existed. So uh, what happens is it, the Antwerp was governed by a kind of an oligarchy of uh, banker because the aristocrats were forbidden to engage in trade. They couldn't touch money. This is really interesting. They had their own revenues from their, their land but they were not supposed to, to be commerce, you know, or commerce oriented. That had a lot to do with the religion too, by the way. So a lot of the commerce was uh, controlled by foreigners. So we had uh, traders from the Venetian Republic, Republic of Genoa, Republic of Ragusa, from Spain and Portugal. Uh, also, Antwerp was known to be one of the most tolerant city in Europe. Not only did they have Catholics, which was the majority, but they were tolerant towards Jews, towards Anabaptists, uh, and many other uh, religions that existed before Reformation. And once you have money and trade and so on, what happens is that you have artists because they know where the money is. And that's the only place where they can get commissions is a place where it's, it's rich. So there was a highly, a very high number of painters around 360 in 1560 in a city uh, with a population of roughly 89,000 people. So that's a quite a, a good uh, quota, if you want. But after the 1570s, and we'll see why the city's banking business declined, England and then its borrowing in Antwerp in 1574, and slowly Amsterdam replaced Antwerp uh, as the ma major trending center in the region. So let's look at the problem that Antwerp went through. In 1566, was uh, as a follow-up to the reform movement. Uh, there was a series of iconoclastic um, events that happened all over Europe, but particularly in 1566 in, um, in Antwerp, where a 
group of peasants coming from uh, south of uh, Antwerp came into the city and before the citizens could do anything to protect themselves, they started uh, demolishing and looting the churches, uh, including the superb uh, cathedral of Antwerp, which was one of the jewels of the, the city. And uh, they literally devastated the interior of the church. There, there were about 40 different altars in the cathedral and three were left more or less untouched by the end. So you can imagine the devastation uh, that happened. It's by the way, it's not Luther who didn't want images. It's actually some other uh, people that he knew that were stricter than him that started making sermons around and uh, encouraged people to uh, get rid of all images, particularly sculptures, uh, but uh, also all the uh, stained glass windows, frescoes, or paintings. So they would whitewash the wall, they would demolish the, the stained glass windows and take down the sculptures. As you can see here, they are ready to take that uh, bishop down the wall. In that, this is called the uh, Bildenstorm, which is the, the uh, storm of the statues, if you want. Other things, in 1576, there was the, the event of the uh, Spanish Fury. The, it's a number of uh, events that were, were the soldiers that had not been paid uh, sacked the cities in the low countries. Uh, these were most of the time, they were mercenaries and they, if they were not paid, they would help themselves. And this is what happened. They came into Antwerp and other cities and uh, devastated the whole city, uh, stealing whatever they could to try to uh, get their, their money back if you want. So a thousand buildings were torched, as many as 17,000 men, women and children were murdered. Um, and this really created an anti-Spanish um, sentiment in many parts of Europe, though most of the mercenaries were not Spaniards, but were German. Most of the, the armies of the time were made of mercenaries, by the way. So they were not especially, they were uh, directed by Spaniards in that case. So in, to follow up, in uh, 1585, um, the Antwerp uh, was trying to resist to what uh, Philip II wanted. Want, uh, when Charles uh, abdicated in 15, I think 56, um, because of uh, declining health, uh, his son Philip II uh, succeeded him. But Charles had always been very fond of the Low Countries. He was born in Ghent and uh, had been raised in, in the Low Countries most of his life, uh, could speak Flemish and French, uh, spoke very little Spanish, by the way, and therefore was resented in Spain itself. And um, when his son uh, succeeded him, he spoke Spanish, didn't know much of the Low Countries, but so one thing is that it was a rich place. So by that time, they already had really spent far too much of the gold that they had found in the New World and uh, were borderline bankrupted. And so they said, okay, we're gonna raise taxes in the Low Countries. They, they have lots of money, they can do that. And so he increased the taxes, also suppressed some of the rights that many of the cities had over there. And people couldn't believe it. And so they revolted and they said no. And then he also decided they're far too tolerant. Philip II was a very, a very hard Catholic man and wanted uh, Catholicism to reign uh, by all means. And so he, after the, the seat of uh, the sack of Antwerp, when Antwerp was defeated, they gave the population in Antwerp two years to either reconvert to Catholicism or to leave. Then they had to pack up their stuff and then go, uh, go somewhere else. And most of the people, and unfortunately, 
people that had followed the, the reform uh, were typically the middle class, hard worker, specialized skill worker. And all these people fled and went to the what is now the Netherlands, to the northern provinces, some to Germany, some to England, uh, but mostly to the north because they spoke the same language. And so that was the easiest thing. So uh, the, not only did the trade uh, suffered of uh, what happened, but also the loss of uh, specialized labor was really bad. And so a lot of the painters we'll talk about when we talk about the, the northern provinces uh, were descended from people that lived in Antwerp. The 80 year war that lasted from 1566 to 1648 is what you call the Dutch war of independence. Um, once the, the people in the low countries realized what Philip II was gonna do, uh, they decide to resist and decide, no, we, want, uh, we don't want to pay that much money and we want to have free freedom of expression and freedom of religion. And so they started a movement and named at the head of their movement uh, a prince of Nassau, uh, who was William, uh, known as the silent. He was a, a rather silent character, who had been at the court of Spain and knew them very well and was for a while really a friend of them, but decided that uh, it was unfair. And so he started. Um, leading a little bit against his will, but he was chosen and he uh, led that revolt against the Spaniards. And so this started that war, 80 year war. In a very smart move, people in the Northern provinces that were only at that time, uh, five provinces um, blocked the Northern part of what is now Belgium where they had the access for the Scheld River to go to Antwerp. And that was named as a blockade of the harbor. Once the, the harbor is blockaded, it's, that's it. You can't have any ship coming in and out. So for Antwerp, it was a disaster. Um, so big, big uh, problem and it only ended up in 1648 with the Treaty of Munster and the Treaty of Utrecht, uh, where they gave finally the, the right for the Republic of the Netherlands to exist away from the power of, um, of uh, Spain, though <coughs> unofficially that already started in around 1600. As we come back to the Archdukes, Albert and Isabella, uh, they were named after different governors, some really very bad and very cruel. They were named by um, the, the Spanish king to uh, become the governors of uh, the low countries. And Archdukes, Albert and Isabella, you will see them coming back many times because they were great patron of the arts but they also were very reasonable uh, people and very much liked by the population in the, the Spanish low countries. Um, they managed to come to a 12 year truce between 1609 and 1621, which is going to be a comeback of some of the commerce and the, uh, some peace. So they were able to do uh, some things. And here is a map that shows you now the, uh, the two parts of the Low Countries, the Northern provinces with uh, Holland, Utrecht, Gelderland, Overijssel, Friesland, and Drenthe, and then Zeeland. And then in the South, you have the other um, provinces with the exception of the Principality of Liege, which was a bishopric, a free bishopric. Um, was this forms Belgium. So the blue is more or less the, the, uh, the borders of uh, now the Belgiums and a little less than what is shown there, uh, a little more than what is shown there, the Northern provinces are uh, the Netherlands. Excuse me. 
It's okay. So finally, in 1648, as I mentioned, uh, we have the swearing the Treaty of Munster, which is going to end that 80 year war uh, and officialize the, the, the existence of the, uh, the Republic of the Netherlands. So I hope you're not completely lost in there. <laughs> But it's really important to understand why there is such a difference between the South and the North. And there's still nowadays, there is a kind of a dislike between the North and the South. If you go and drive in, in the Netherlands with a Belgian license plate, they're often going to cut short in front of you. And so it still exists. So let's uh, look at the difference between these. So we have the Southern province, which we're, we're going to call from now on the Spanish Netherlands. Uh, they are in on the right, sorry, the United Provinces that becomes the uh, Republic of the Netherlands. The, what is now Belgium, the Spanish Netherlands is ruled by a governor or viceroy that reports to the Spanish monarch. Whereas in the Netherlands, it's an independent Republic and it's governed and it's difficult to say it's governed, but they have a stadholder or a stadholder in English that is not, doesn't have all the rights on all the different provinces. Each province has its own stadholder. And one of them is going to be elected to take care of the foreign affairs of all of them. Because you need, just like Washington and the different states here. Washington doesn't have the right on everything in the country, but particularly foreign affairs and so on are led by them. That's pretty much the same as what happens in the Netherlands. The kind of society you find is tra traditional stratified society, aristocracy, middle class, working class. And this explains a little bit why the, I didn't uh, really go into it uh, yet, but when the, net, when the low countries revolted against Philip II, they at first were all going to revolt against him. And then the one in the southern provinces started moving back. And one of the big reason was this, that's where the court was. So you had the whole group of aristocrats that lived there and wanted to hold to their power. In the Northern provinces, they were far away from the court and pretty independent. And so they didn't care, but if ever the revolt had worked for all the provinces, all the aristocrats would have lost their rights and their wealth at the same time. So th they are really the one that pushed on the brakes and said, no, we don't do it. Now in the, United provinces, you have only a middle class and a working class, but middle class typically no aristocracy. The aristocracy that exists now in the, in the Netherlands, now, the nowadays, are really made just for the life of the person. So let's say that you are a great uh, writer, you become, you name Baroness by the queen, but your children are not going to be Baron or Baroness. So it's just for the life of the person. But at that time, it didn't even exist. The Spanish Netherlands are Catholic. The United Provinces are Protestants with toleration on Jews and other obediences. Uh, the Spanish Netherlands goes with the Counter Reformation and the United Provinces on the uh, Reformation. The church, church is very powerful, not as it, what it used to be, but it was. So let's look at, is the church Catholic or not? What does Catholic mean? It means universal. So is the church still universal at that time, even in the uh, Spanish Netherlands? Since 1054, Christendom was split between East Orthodox and West, the Roman uh, Catholic. Uh, 
it was in great part because of the question of the authority of the Pope, but there were other reasons too, liturgical reasons and so on. The, the Orthodox didn't recognize the single power of the Pope. They thought they were a series of archbishops that were uh, at equal importance. During the Middle Age, it was the church. It had all powers. It was the most powerful institution in Europe. More than half of the art produced is religious, public or private, and with the function of instructing people of the, the Bible and the message of Christ. We have the big uh, great schism uh, during the, between 1378 and 1417, which is going to have that moment where the Pope goes to Avignon in France. And so we're going to have eight popes that live in Avignon until it's resolved and Pope goes back to Rome. But from there, uh, it's the result of that is the Pope had to compromise with the, the different countries. And so there's a, a tentative to limit the absolute power of the papacy. The Pope is going to cede important rights to some European rulers. For example, Spain and France are going to name their own candidates to high ecclesiastical position, whereas before it was made from Rome. And in other countries, it's going to remain the same, but in particular in Spain and particularly in Spain and France, no. And this is going to give a lot of power to the king. So you have uh, an increase, increasing uh, power of the king in France and Spain, expansion of the monarchy. But this is not the case in the Holy Roman Empire, which means Austria, Germany, and including the low countries. We come to a point too, and that, that was already one of the uh, griefs of uh, Luther and of his acolytes, is that the idea that uh, there was an abuse of religious imagery, that the, the image itself had become the center of <laughs> worship instead of just the idea. So you have all these miraculous images of the Virgin, for example, and people would go there and the image itself had become the, 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 the center of attention of people, not anymore Mary, it was the image. And this is one of the big reasons why they decided they, uh, in some of the reformed churches, they didn't want any images not to, so that, to avoid that kind of a problem. Also, the higher clergy gained a very bad reputation uh, of simony. They, they sell the charge to the people in their family, all the privileges and so on. And so they, um, they're really crooked, let's put it that way. The low um, uh, clergy is very uneducated. And so you have a problem uh, with the, the little parish priest, for example, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Whereas you still have in the orders, Franciscan, Benedictine, Jesuits, and so on, you have very high learning. So that's a big contrast. And then, uh, so after the Reformation, you have that, um, how can I say, really hatred, you can say, between the Reformed churches and the Roman Catholic Church. So look at Reformation. The Reformation, and it's mostly uh, at the beginning, it's uh, Luther, though they were people that were uh, arguing about things before, but they had even uh, been burned at the stake or killed uh, to avoid these kind of things. But Martin Luther came at a time that was propitious to, to um, how can I say, to, to be understood by the elector of the state where he was. The uh, German, the now Germany was made of 300 and some states and each of the state had electors. And these electors would elect the emperor which always ended up being the Habsburg in Austria. And they were kind of depending on them for defending themselves and so on. When Martin, who was a Dominic, an 
Dominican, no, is it, was he Dominican or Augustinian? I think Augustinian uh, friar. Um, he, uh, when he, he started really uh, being angry about what was happening with the church, he wrote to the Archbishop of Mainz and Magdeburg, uh, protesting at first against the sale of indulgences. These indulgences were something really interesting. They were a little piece of paper, and this would promise if you give money to buy these indulgences, it would forward not your afterlife uh, position, but your dear ones, your mother, father, or whatever. If you have these indulgences, they might not stay in limbo for a long time. They might go to, to paradise faster. No, they, when they started building the new St. Peter in Rome, which was requiring an enormous amount of money, they found themselves quickly short of money. And so they dispatched all over Europe priests that were in charge of selling indulgences to build St. Peter. And people would just go and fall for it and, and buy these indulgences. And so Luther really wasn't happy at all. And so, in the letter he sent to the Archbishop, he sent what is called the Disputation of Martin Luther on the power and efficacy of indulgences, which came to be known as the 95 Thesis of Luther. And so that's a first thing. So we have Luther in Germany. Uh, a little later, we have uh, Zwingli, who in 1523, um, Public, publicly called for the removal of statues of saints and other icons. And also uh, this led to, for, to demonstrations uh, and iconoclastic activities. Yes, swingly. In France, a little later, we have uh, John Calvin, who was born Jean Covin, or Chauvin, depending on the, the pronunciation. Uh, a very intelligent man, good student, but uh, he also uh, started uh, protesting the, what was happening with the Catholic Church and started writing, and started writing uh, about uh, these ideas. You know the story as well as I do. He ended up having to be exiled to um, Switzerland, Geneva in particular, but then he went a little too far there, was, forced to move a little again back to France, quickly back to Switzerland and so on. But uh, he was a very, very important figure of the Protestant movement. Um, and in fact, the, uh, whereas uh, Germany is mostly Lutheran, the Netherlands is gonna be mostly Calvinist, but they accept the other uh, reformed churches too. And then, of course, we have the last this uh, Church of England, where in 1529, uh, for the reasons that you know, which is Catherine of Aragon, he wanted to get an official separation um, accepted by decreed by the Pope. The Pope refused, and uh, he decided, "Okay, I'm the King of England, and will it go my way?" And so he starts and. Uh, um, declared that he was by not, by that time the church, the head of the Church of England, and this is in 1529. So here's more or less the way Europe looks. In purple, and this is after 1517, you have the Protestant uh, religion. In blue, you have Catholic uh, religion. In uh, red, you have the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox. And then uh, all in green is Islam. And this varied. You know, some places uh, came back to Catholicism with the uh, hard work of the Catholic Church. When we talk about iconoclasm, this was not a first, of course. The uh, when the Christians started. Uh, proselyting, I never know how to say it. Anyway, went to uh, work to spread the Catholic religion in uh, Rome and, and in the empire. Uh, they destroyed 
a lot of what existed of the Roman cults. And so the temples and the writings and so on, a lot of these and then sculptures were uh, defaced. You had two Byzantine iconoclastic uh, part um, events, uh, some between 730 and 87, and again in 18, 814 and 842, uh, where they uh, whitewashed the walls again, even on the mosaics, the beautiful mosaics that existed then, as well as uh, uh, burn the icons that exist. And this is where we were talking about uh, the St. Catherine Monastery in Sinai. Um, it has one of the richest collection, the richest collection of pre-iconoclastic um, movement uh, over there because they were protected. And a lot of the old ones before these iconoclastic uh, events were burned and destroyed. Huge iconoclasts during the French Revolution, the churches, the art uh, were really, uh, it, it was just uh, terrible. And not too far from us in 1917, you have the Russian Revolution, same thing. And in Afghanistan, as you know, uh, the Buddhas that were blown up uh, is also iconoclasm. Now, on the other side, you have the Counter-Reformation. And this is the church deciding to, um, to just confirm uh, their, their existence and uh, their, uh, their dogmas and so on. So, there are four different sessions uh, for the um, Council of Trent. So four times the, the cardinals and scholars got together and decided how to formulate uh, things to reinforce them or maybe modify them. So they, uh, for it, as far as we are concerned, the, what is important is the religious images. So the religious imagery was welcomed as support to religious teaching and the council advocated, but that's as we've seen in Italy too, the, it advocated pictorial clarity and narrative relevance in religious art, which means when what you painted had to be in the book, you couldn't invent little figures as it happened during the Mannerist period. So the being finished with a good part of the history now, uh, we're going to talk about Baroque art and where that comes from. And I suggest that we take a little uh, five minutes relax. You can stretch your legs. You can ask me questions. You can uh, unmute yourself, people, if you have questions online and ask me on that very difficult history of the Northern countries. I hope I haven't confused you completely. Uh, any questions? And please have the coffee is at the, the, the end of the hallway. Yes. So without the art telling the story of what's happening in the church when that was all spooked, and I, I was in an understanding that everything came from the art, the whole story of the Bible. Uh, it actually it's really interesting because as you know, in the Jewish uh, religion. Uh, they are against images too, though if you go back to the early synagogues, they were full of paintings and mosaics. So that's a movement that kind of moved, uh, became stricter later on. Uh, the main, when they talk about the engraved image, which is the, the word of the Bible, it's understood mostly as sculptures. Uh, but the church very quickly came as it is in Hinduism uh, and others uh, understood that to a population that was mostly illiterate, images were very important for them to understand. Now the result of the reformed church is that because it was mostly the books, the, the, the word that was important, they became much more literate. So you see in Protestant countries, the literacy goes very quickly way up. Whereas in the other, Madel, you can put the light on just for a minute. No, the other side, the other side. The, no, 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 there. 
Uh, to your right. No, when you look at the door to your right. There we go. That's it. That's it. That's good. That's good. <laughs> no, put the light on, please. Yes. Thank you. So that that's really uh, an, a quite interesting point is that you become you get the you get the literacy level of about 90 percent in in protestant uh, countries whereas in the rest of the of the you know in catholic countries you have a literacy a percentage of literacy of not even 20 percent because they're not encouraging people to read the bible they want them to learn through the priest yes that's in france yeah this is the qatars it, it's a whole story of um not believing in in the the trinity uh believing in in really dualist dualist uh, thing it's good or bad you have two things in you the good and the bad then they fight and so on no there, there are some you always have some cults that are gonna they've been terribly persecuted oh yeah they they were uh really uh, crusades against we call the the croisade des albigeois the albigensis or whatever uh, is uh, albi is a town in the south uh, west of um, of france and uh, they were all all there because they knew that the king was one day going to come after it's all fortresses because they want to defend and the the king and, and the troops attacked them and they burned everything so that yeah the qatars that's a different so did i confuse you completely or not did i confuse you completely or not <laughs> so uh but i think it, it it's important to know uh, the story of that to understand why i'm talking about the the Flemish part, you know, the, the Spanish Netherlands, and then I'll talk about the others, because the configuration of society is completely different. So. And there's a word, a couple of words I'm not familiar with. Yes, tell me. S-I-M-O-N-Y, what is that like? S-I-M? Oh, simony. Yeah, what is that? Simony is the setting of charges. So uh, you want to become bishop, and you are bishop and you're a friend of yours, you know, you're gonna sell the charge for you to become bishop. And you're not supposed to. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Okay. No, no question on the back row there. <laughs> Okay, if uh, Jerry, could you turn off the light, please, so I can. Okay. So we come back, and uh, we're now talk, going to talk about art and northern uh, Baroque art that lasts more or less between 1600 and 1750. Of course, some painters are going to go on painting in the mannerist style, and we'll see some uh, further than 1600. And some start changing the style already a little before. So the etymology of Baroque is, comes from, uh, most probably from Portuguese, Barroco, uh, which means irregular pearl. And I show you a superb example of a Renaissance pearl uh, jewelry that is made with pearls. And then uh, the rest is ivory and uh, enamels. I, I love that, that piece, it's just so gorgeous. It is characterized by dramatic expressions and it's a result of the Counter-Reformation, by the way, where the church really emphasized that we have to appeal to the emotions of the believers. 
it's very important. And so the way to do it is when you have a painting is you get very dramatic expression. You see all these faces turned upwards is because they are appealing to God. Uh, surfaces richly textured, spatial grandeur, you have these huge paintings or, or big frescoes, theatrical flamboyance, asymmetry, sharp diagonal line. And as you know, whereas in the Renaissance, particularly early Renaissance and high Renaissance, everything is pretty much vertical. And when you're vertical, you very you have a good balance, right? But as soon as you have a diagonal line, what happens is that either you're going to fall or you're going to move back up, which means there is energy, there is a movement that is involved in the that kind of a design. Are we looking at a, a neck part of a neck piece? Yes, this this would be a pendant. Okay. I would love it. I take it right away. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. They 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 were doing this kind of uh, of uh, jewelry piece. It's just amazing. So what's the difference again between the Spanish Netherlands and the United Provinces? Uh, the Spanish Netherlands are mostly centered. Uh, the art is centered in Antwerp. And we'll have a series of names, Rubens being number one, no doubt. Van Dyck, who is so talented, but is overshadowed by Rubens, is going to be encouraged to go to England, where they need a great painter. And Jordaens is another painter that stayed in, in, uh, in uh, Antwerp, too. And you have a whole series of small masters who are not that small, by the way. You have the children of uh, Bruegel, who's Jan Bruegel. You have the Franken family. Uh, I don't have enough fingers to give all of them, but we'll discover uh, some of them. And then a very interesting specialty we find in the 17th century in Antwerp is collaborative work. And we'll have a lesson that is dedicated to that where masters are going to work together, not a master with assistants, but two masters are going to work on the same piece. And this is a kind of a fashion where people like to have two master painting that two masters have done. So uh, really interesting. In the United Provinces, as we see, we have a whole series of centers, Amsterdam, Harlem, Delft, Utrecht, and many other, Leiden, and so on. So in Amsterdam, we have uh, Hembrandt. In Harlem, we have Hals. In Delft, we have the May. In Utrecht, what they are called the Caravaggisti, who are Painters, many of them have been to Italy and have been influenced by the tenebrism of Caravaggio. Uh, by the way, Utrecht remains a Catholic province in the Netherlands. It has a bishop, a bishopric, and it's one, the only province where Catholicism is uh, officially accepted. In the others, it's tolerated as long as they don't try to proselytize. And then we have in the United Provinces, the emergence of new uh, genre, uh, landscape for its own, uh, still life that show inanimate objects and genre, which is domestic uh, subject in painting. And why is that? Because there is no more religious patron. They can't have paintings in the churches. Uh, the, the few works that are done are purely educational, like the prints that the Rembrandt have done, but they're not to be set on the wall, really, except in Utrecht. So they have to find another uh, series of patrons, if you want. And so this becomes now paintings for the middle class or the rich merchants. And so then they, they want decorative, decorative pieces landscape that's going to celebrate the new country that, as you, you will see, where they uh, recover a lot of the land from the sea. Uh, and uh, so they're very proud of their country. Still life is that they start importing beautiful pieces from uh, Italy and so on. And they try to show the skill at differentiating how the light impacts these different textures. 
And then genre is sometimes moralizing paintings that show, okay, the, the idle servant, she's doing nothing. So the result is the cat goes away with the fish, you know? And so these are moralizing type of stories or just sometimes pure descriptive things. To stay in Spanish Netherlands, it's gonna be influenced by what they call Devocio Moderna, which is a movement of religious reform within uh, the Catholic Church. And it's rediscovering the genuine, genuine uh, pious practices such as humility, obedience, and simplicity of life. It had started already at the end of the 14th century, but uh, because of the reform movement, it is emphasized because they're really going back to the, the primary values. Uh, this is going to be mostly um, encapsulated, if you want, in the uh, Thomas Akempis, The Imitation of Christ, which is still a text that is read nowadays. Uh, the imitation of Christ, where uh, people are encouraged to follow uh, what Christ did and suffer with him in his passion and so on. Also an influence, and we'll see uh, that very much with uh, Rubens, but already with uh, Abraham Janssens, La Grande Maniera. Many of the painters go to Italy or talk a lot to people that have been in Italy and they influenced by the aesthetic uh, style that is derived from classicism and the art of the, the high Renaissance. They uh, incorporate visual metaphors to, to suggest noble qualities. Uh, they definitely appeal to intellectual faculties and show the noblest human actions and it's based on principles of reason and order. This is very much what Rubens is going to be about and we'll see that next time. What was the Flemish art in the 16th century? Because of course, they always look to what has been done before and there is a derivation of some of that. So in the 16th century, probably the, the greatest, uh, great, uh, uh, greater painter was Jan Gossart. And Jan Gossart had been to Italy and came back as what they call a Romanist because he was influenced by Rome. And uh, he was a French speaking uh, painter from the low country. He's also known as Jean Mabuse. It's the, 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 both names apply to him. And he is um, really influenced by the Renaissance. You can see in the, the work here on the left, you have the uh, Renaissance architecture, very much the, the position of the, the models and so on is very much influenced by, uh, by Italy. And you have the, the uh, Danae and the, the shower, the golden shower. Now, towards the end of the 16th century, developed, if you remember well, in Italy, developed that new, that end of the high Renaissance uh, ends up with the mannerism, and that includes the later work of Michelangelo as the Last Judgment, for example, in the Sistine Chapel, and a whole series of painters like Bronzino and, uh, and uh, many others that show art, and that's what the, the Counter-Reformation is gonna go against, is an art that is complicated. Uh, it's not looking at nature, it's looking at other things that have been done and it becomes a, a concept made purely intellectually. And sometimes nowadays we have no way of knowing what they meant. Absolutely, if there's no text that accompanies the painting, we have no idea what they really meant. They add figures, um, next to the Virgin, it looks like a Greek philosopher. What is he doing there? We don't know. Uh, uh, often also the style, you have contorted uh, forms, you have a special range of colors. You don't have the rich coloring, for example, of the high Renaissance. And that has also touched, of course, the um, Flemish painters. Uh, Hans Floris was a very known painter at the end of the 16th century. Uh, Many of his paintings were destroyed during the iconoclastic period, by the way. But here you have an example uh, of these 
uh, very twisted form, unnatural uh, forms. But on the other hand, you also have an amazing painter such as Peter Brogel. Um, Peter Brogel, who shows life of the regular people, the hardworking people who suffer from, you know, the seasons <coughs> or the lack of food or whatever. And this is one of my favorite, the hunter in the snow, showing part of the, the labors of the months. Uh, Peter Brogel. Peter Brogel has two sons. He dies pretty young. He's uh, in his uh, late 40s when he dies. And uh, uh, has two sons who both are going to become painters. And uh, particularly uh, Jan Brogel, the younger of the two, uh, is going to be a very influent painter. So this is the, what we see as the past in the 16th century. But when Rubens will come back from Italy in 1609, there is one painter in Antwerp who was very successful, who suddenly is going to lose almost everything because of the fame of Rubens. And uh, this is Abraham Janssens. He added the name of his mother, Van Neusen, because Janssen is a very common name in, uh, in Antwerp and in the, the Flemish country. Uh, so um, he added that to be differentiated. And he lives from six, 1575 to 1632, was born in Antwerp, studied at the Yaling, who is a kind of second rank uh, painter, but then went to, to Italy for five years. And when he came back, becomes master in the Antwerp guild. He marries well, has eight children, becomes the dean of the Antwerp Guild of St. Luke in 1607, that's two years before Rubens comes back, joins the conferees, uh, uh, confraternity, if you want, of the Romanists, so because he's been to, to Italy, so he's part of that, this is a very intellectual group, he hopes to have commissions through that, he gets lots of commissions, and then Rubens comes, and it's all over. Everybody wants Rubens. Within a year of Rubens coming back to Antwerp, everybody talks about him and him only. What year did Rubens come back to Antwerp? 1609. And that was the end of Abraham Janssens. He went on painting, but had far less commissions and ended up almost only producing works for export. Lots of works that were exported to Spain and, and other countries. So I'm going to show you a few of his works, so painting in Antwerp before Rubens. This is one of his works, and that was a, a big commission that he had there, uh, uh, showing uh, Scaldis and Antwerp. Scaldis is the Schelde, Schelde River, so in Latin. So it's an allegory of the um, river, the river Schelt that was typically shown in Italy always as a god and uh, they knew so it typically had a, a horn of abundance of you know uh, just um, showing the, the prosperity that the river brings to a city and so you have uh, the, the woman represents the city of Antwerp this is very much, as you can see, influenced by Caravaggio, that tenebris, the contrast of uh, dark and light. <clears throat> but it has some of the marks of mannerist of the time. It's very well built, but we, what we will see with the difference with Rubens is Rubens feels that from his inside, if you want. So when he, he paints, there is something coming out of his paintings that are unique compared to this one. He is good technically, definitely, but it, there is going to be a big difference. And so here I'm showing you a group of uh, sculpture that shows a Rom, um, the river uh, Nile, for example. Um, so uh, again, that allegory of the river as a god. In the Phoenix Art Museum, we do have an Abraham Janssens, you know that one, the Saint Sebastian. And there it's very typically mannerist. The, the position is 
not quite natural. There is something about it that doesn't show you the, the suffering and so on that you would expect from a Saint Sebastian. Uh, a lot of marks that, that uh, can be qualified as uh, mannerist. Lots of symbolism that are typical of uh, Flemish paintings too. So the, the, the vines and the, uh, the um, landscape behind and so on and the, and the sky are all very symbolic of the, that moment in uh, San Sebastian's life. Jupiter rebuked by Venus made in 1612. So by that time, uh, Rubens is back. And you can see the complicated um, composition uh, here showing the, the god uh, that, as we know, always looked at women <laughs> and Venus for once is pushing him back. He's not happy. A beautiful uh, Calvary or crucifixion that shows uh, Mary and John and the other Marys there. Uh, if you look at the way the, the thieves are shown on either side, are very mannerist in the contortion of the bodies. And here's a series of the Virgin and the Child with St. John the Baptist. Uh, at that time, 16, 17, 20, this looks very much like a Rubens. He's himself influenced by Rubens in that painting. And so, as I say, it, it's really tragic for an artist like him, who is a good artist, but Rubens comes with a bang and it, it's going to take over the whole of Europe, by the way. So I hope that I haven't confused you too much. And next time uh, we will see uh, the first of two uh, painting, uh, first of two on Peter Paul Rubens, his early years and his diplomatic missions. Uh, Rubens is an amazing uh, painter and has had in incredible influence on painters that follow. Uh, but because of sometimes the bombastic type of painting that I mostly studio, by the way, uh, he's decried by people saying, ah, oh, Rubens is just too much flesh and women that are huge and so on. But when you look at the work that he did himself, it's just extraordinary. So Saturday, as you know, we have changed the, the Thursday to Saturday now. So for once, it's going to be the same week. Normally, uh, we will go for we'll go for staggered weeks. Uh, but on Saturday, I will do Daumier, part the first one of the 1850 to 1900 series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.